Hello and welcome back to Guillotined 18th Century Chemist Theater. Today we're going to build off some of the redox work we've been talking about and focus on the idea of oxidation numbers or oxidation states, which are really glorified charges. Uh, ionic compounds obviously have charges, uh, but if we want to talk about covalent compounds, uh, the fact that they share means we can't talk about charge. And so chemists made a workaround called the oxidation number or oxidation state, where we pretend that covalent compounds uh, are actually engaged in a hypothetical ionic bond, and then we work from there. So it's a way that we can find charge for everybody. <laughs> we just can't call it charge. And so oxidation is, remember, just the uh, idea of losing electrons. Um, and so you're going to see an oxidation number or a charge increase when you lose electrons. That should make sense. You're going to become more positive. And reduction is the idea of gaining electrons, which means that uh, you're going to see charges go down or reduce, which actually makes sense there. And so oxygen is going to gain two electrons to get a negative two charge. Now, you don't have to start in elemental form, but these examples do because I wanted to put them together and make this little reaction that many of you have seen before, and that's the idea of magnesium and oxygen getting together and forming magnesium oxide, a, a uh, highly exothermic reaction with a characteristic bright white light. And those are called half reactions, by the way. If you only see half of what's going on in a reaction, and those can be stitched together for all kind of high-level chemistry shenanigans. And so an oxidation state or an oxidation number, as we mentioned before, is really a faux charge or real charge, depending if you're ionic or covalent. And so it follows all the same rules you would expect for ionic compounds. Uh, free or uncombined elements are going to have a zero charge, hence a zero oxidation state. Compounds that are neutral are going to have a zero oxidation state uh, come total, but internally, then they have to come up with whatever they need to to make it be zero. For instance, a sodium chloride table salt is a neutral compound, but sodium's got the plus one charge and chloride's got the minus one charge because sodium gains, I mean, sodium loses electrons and chlorine gains electrons. And so we'll be often trying to figure out what's going on inside compounds to get an oxidation state of zero. Ions are going to have the charge or oxidation state you would expect them to have. Alkaline metals will always be plus one. Alkaline earth will be plus two because they want to lose one and two respectively. And then polyatomics will want to have the overall charge that is listed. And so their oxidation states will line up to end up with that final positive or negative number. For instance, in nitrate, there's an overall oxidation state of negative one or charge of negative one. And each oxygen is going to be a negative two. So X minus six equals negative one. Hence, X has to equal 5. Now, how did we figure out that nitrogen was a 5? That, that's the tricky part. And the only tricky part about oxidation states or oxidation numbers is not, are nonmetals. Because it's easy to figure out who gets the electrons when it's a metal and a nonmetal. It's going to be the nonmetal. But if you're dealing with nonmetal with nonmetal, then one of them is going to win and one of them is going to lose the hypothetical tug of war. And that tug of war can be measured with something called electronegativity, which is an atom's desire for electrons in a bond. Now, we're not going to quantify this right now. We're going to talk more about it later, but that leads to a pecking order of nonmetals, which I'll show you right here. Now, these are pretty much exactly what you would expect anyway from ionic compounds, uh, but there's a pecking order. Just like the game of war you might have played when you were a kid, uh, ace beats everybody, and king's still pretty good, but it doesn't beat ace, etc., etc., and that's how nonmetals work. Fluorine's the ace. Nobody beats fluorine, and so it's going to get that negative one charge in, in every bond. Oxygen actually would be next. It's going to get that negative two, except when fluorine's around, then it will actually lose its electrons to fluorine. Um, and then the halogens, again, are, are going to be the minus one. There's very few people that can beat halogens. Uh, sand's another more electronegative halogen. And the nice thing about hydrogen is it's usually a plus one, which means that it's not going to compete with oxygen or chlorine for electrons. And in fact, if it's with some active metals, it will actually take an electron uh, because that's how badly those metals want to get rid of them. And those are easy to identify. Just look for a metal and then hydrogen second. Just because hydrogen second doesn't mean it's a hydride. Uh, I might have made that mistake uh, in the last lesson about redox. I'm not sure if I did that or not. But only when they're with active metals will a hydrogen be a hydride and have that negative one charge. And the neat thing about this is everybody else just sort of does what they need to do to make the oxidation state work out the way it does. And so you're going to see a wide range of oxidation states. Um, so we're going to take the same skills we learned for figuring out the charge of multiple charge cations, and we're going to apply that to nonmetals. Same idea, though. They'll do whatever they need to do. And so we've got uh, the combustion of methane here. And we'll figure out all the oxidation states, and then afterwards we'll figure out who's being oxidized and reduced. 
And so we've got hydrogen there. Remember, each of those hydrogens are a plus one oxidation state. Uh, you don't usually list all of them. You usually just list one. But for the sake of that, let's make it easy. Let's just jump over to the next one real quick. Remember, oxygen is going to be a minus two when it's alone, but a minus, I mean, a, a zero when it's alone, but a minus two when it's in a compound. And so let's go back and take a look at carbon in each of these situations. Uh, on the left-hand side, carbon is dealing with a plus, plus four oxidation state, so it's got to be a minus four. But on the right-hand side, uh, carbon's dealing with a minus four oxidation state, so here it needs to be a plus four. So this is an example of another nonmetals doing what they need to do. Uh, here's hydrogen and oxygen doing exactly what you thought hydrogen and oxygen would do together. So most of the stuff works out exactly what you think it would be. But we can look at the changes in oxidation states to figure out who's being oxidized and reduced in a redox reaction. Uh, in this case, carbon is definitely being oxidized. It's uh, going from a, a negative 4 to a positive 4, and, and oxygen is being reduced. Uh, it's kind of neat to actually see oxygen be the oxidizing agent. You know, it can often be other elements. Oxidation states have a giant range of possible values, and many elements have multiple values available to them. And a lot of periodic tables, if they have detail, will show you all of those. For instance, carbon can range um, positive 4 all the way through negative 4. And there's a lot we can do with oxidation uh, states. Uh, one of the neat things we can do is we can balance equations with them. They get us started on, on difficult redox reactions. I'm not going to talk about those today. Maybe we'll throw a lesson up there later. But for the first year chemistry student, really trial and error is all you need to get through most balanced equations anyway. So let's practice just figuring out oxidation states. Go ahead, pause the video, name all these, and then figure out the oxidation states. And uh, I'll wait for you. OK, welcome back. Let's go ahead and name all these compounds here. Again, we got some ionic, we got some covalent, we got some ions, we got some polyatomic ions. Lots of stuff here. Remember that CH2O is formaldehyde, not carbonated water. Carbonated water is a mixture. Please don't say formaldehyde is carbonated water. So anyway, calcium hydroxide is exactly what you would expect for an ionic compound. Remember that oxygen is going to want a minus two charge. Hydrogen is going to want a plus one charge. And so that means that hydroxide has the minus one charge you would expect it to have. Two hydroxides would be a minus two, and so calcium gets the plus two that you would expect it to have. And so this is one of the situations where writing down the oxidation state of each element actually is pretty helpful. Uh, I don't have a room to do that, so I'll just write it down for one element. Nitrate, we already talked about before. Imagine three negative twos. That's a negative six. And so for an overall negative one, we need a positive five. Silver sulfide is exactly what you would think would be. Silver is plus one charge, just like you would expect off a common ion chart. And sulfide is a negative two, again, based on periodic position. Copper two sulfide, copper two is exactly what you think, <laughs> plus two. Three plus twos are balanced out by two negative threes. Uh, ammonium, again, think of four plus one charges. Uh, and then if they have a plus one charge overall, we're going to need a negative three. Formaldehyde is going to be a negative two for the oxygens, plus one for the hydrogens. And that actually means carbon equals zero, because plus one plus one minus two leaves you with a zero. Lead four is exactly what you think lead four would be. Iodine's again the same. Nitrous acid, not nitric. Again, imagine two negative twos and a positive one, which means that I have to have a positive three in the middle to make that work out. Peroxides really, hydrogen peroxides really are our first exception of the day here. Uh, Peroxide's a negative two oxidation state overall, which means each oxygen's a, a negative one. Um, which makes sense because uh, hydrogen can't be a positive two to balance that out. You need two positive ones to balance two negative twos. Ozone's going to be the zero you'd expect. Potassium permanganate, four negative two charges. With the plus one off potassium means that mang manganese has to be a plus seven to pull its weight. Uh, positive one, positive seven, minus two, minus two, minus two, minus two. Carbon dioxide, we're dealing with two negative twos and a positive four. And ammonium nitrate, again, we've already figured out ammonium nitrate, so I'm just going to transfer the oxidation states that we already figured out for ammonium and nitrate. Um, again, th that one might actually help if you put down, you know, positive one, positive one, positive one, positive one, negative two, negative two. If you were to combine the nitrogens, they would actually appear to be plus one oxidation state each. Uh, but the fact that there are two nitrogens in different locations cues me in that you would you would want to figure them out separately. And that's one of the things that makes uh, ammonium nitrate unstable is the vast difference of oxidation states of nitrogen within the compound. And so there's a lot more practice out there on the internet for not only determining oxidation states, but for determining the change in reactions.
from left to right who's being oxidized in the roots. So I hope that helps. Uh, I hope you enjoy oxidation numbers. Again, don't worry about the exceptions so much. Uh, they'll come along with practice. So uh, thanks for watching and have a great day.